All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is where we're going to be this morning. We're going to pick right up where we left off two weeks ago. And uh, now I know all of y'all remember exactly what we looked at two weeks ago, right? So uh, <laughs> we're talking about, uh, you know, in this particular chapter, Paul gives us some lessons from history. Uh, and he's talking, and what's interesting here, he's talking to a Gentile church, the church at Corinth, but he's giving them a Jewish history lesson. Uh, in other words, going back and looking at some of the things that God's people did uh, that God was pleased with, some of the things they did that he was not pleased with. You say, well, why do we need a history lesson on Jewish people? Well, for that very reason. Um, you know, history, like I said before, history's history, y'all. Uh, like it or not, good or bad, uh, it, it's not there to change, that it's there to learn from, right? And what's the old saying? Those who don't learn from history are doomed to what? Repeat it. And, and so it, it's important that you and I take a look at some of the things. Why are these things recorded for us in the Bible? Why don't we go back to the Old Testament and read all these old stories, you know, and, uh, of things? And, and Well, it's there. Uh, if you look at verse 11 of our text, chapter 10, verse 11, he says, now all these things happened unto them for what? Example. They're all there for examples. Not just an example, but look how he finishes that. They are written for our admonition, your instruction, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So anytime we're in the Old Testament, we're reading a story about Daniel and the lion's den and all of that, just remember, those stories are there not just to give you a history lesson of what happened 6,000 years ago, but also to let you know, hey, this is what you need to apply to your life today. I'm thankful that the Word of God is so applicable to our hearts and our lives today. Y'all, this is not just an old, outdated, archaic book. This is the living Word of God. And I said, one preacher once said, and I like the way he said it. He said, when you read your Bible, remember this. This is not just what God This is what God is saying. Y'all, that, that takes on a total... I mean, in other words, it's always in the present tense, right? It's not just in the past. It's always in the present tense. Well, let's pick up with verse 5 here. And, and he tells us, he, he says, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. And then again, verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for examples. They are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now, if you remember, there were some things that we talked about last time that Israel did right. Right? We, we looked at that in the first four verses uh, here of this chapter. He lets you know, and that's what I like about the Bible. It lets you know the good and the bad, what they did right, how we're to follow that, what they did wrong, how we're not to follow that. If you remember uh, that they allowed God to guide them, remember he talks about the cloud and, 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 and all of that, the pillar of fire by night, and so they allowed God to guide them when they were in the wilderness. That's good, isn't it? Uh, what's the application for us? Y'all, we should allow God and His Word and His Spirit to guide us, right? Just like they, because what did that cloud represent? God's presence was among them, and He guided them every step, whether it was by day or whether it was by night. And I'm here to tell you that's exactly what God will do for you today. That's what His Word will do. That's why the psalmist said, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God still guides, and thank God for that. And so not only did they allow God to guide them, uh, but they also acknowledged the authority of God's man. Remember we talked about that. The Bible says here in the first few verses how they were all baptized unto Moses. And, and, and remember we, we, when we looked at that, we talked about how that means identified. They, they were identified with, with God's man, Moses there. And uh, God, uh, Moses was able to lead them through the desert and they followed God's man. Well, the same principles that play today. Uh, we are to follow God's man as God's man follows the Lord, right? And so that's, that's how it's to work. Uh, they also trusted God to take care of them. Now, that may not sound like a big point to you, but I'm telling you, it's very critical. Uh, remember how he fed them with manna? Remember how the water out of the rock? I mean, God provided, y'all, 
every single need they had. Their shoes never wore out, y'all. I don't care how you make them today, it ain't going to be compared to that. Do you hear me? Their sandals never wore out. God provided every need. Now, as we get to our lesson today, I want you to see some negative examples. That's what he brings out here in our passage. Some things they did that God didn't like. You say, what's the big deal for us? Well, y'all, I'm telling you, our lives are filled with things that God just doesn't like, right? And I'm not saying we're such a wretched sinner. What I'm saying is there's some things that God likes and there's some things that displeases the Lord. And so we need to learn the difference in the two and make sure that we don't do this. Now, uh, look again at verse 5. He says, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. Well, there's your red flag, isn't it? God was not well pleased with many of them, uh, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And they were, and you say, well, why? I thought Moses was leading them out. That's right. But what they did when they got in the wilderness is some of the things he's about to mention that we're going to go through that displeased God, and it caused God's punishment upon God's people while he's trying to lead them to the promised land. Y'all, this is so applicable to where we are today in our lives with the Lord. Now, what did Israel do that we should not do? Uh, what did they do that God was not pleased with? Uh, whatever they did, we certainly want to avoid that, don't we? But y'all, that's what history's for. You learn from it, and you apply it to your life. Well, I want you to look at a few things that he mentions. We're going to have to move quickly with each of these points. There's about five of them, but I think it's important that we understand what he's talking about. Look at verse 6. First of all, he says, Now these things were done for our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. All right? So that, that kind of paints the picture, a broad stroke there with a brush, uh, of a lot of different events that happened to them while they wandered in the wilderness. What does it mean when it says that Israel lusted after evil things? Well, it, 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 uh, it doesn't mean really what you may think it means. And for that, I want to show you something if you'll turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 11. Turn quickly. Now, we're not going to be able to look at all these verses today under each of these points. I'm just going to, from here on, I'm just going to kind of, kind of quote them to you and just kind of tell you the story real quick. But I want you to see this. I want you to turn to Numbers, chapter 11, and I want you to see what he's talking about here when they lusted after evil things. Now, notice here, are you there? In Numbers, chapter 11, Look at verse 4. It says, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again. And they said, Now listen to what they said. Who shall give us flesh to eat? Now remember, they're right out here in the wilderness. God's been giving them manna from heaven every single day. But you know what they did? They got tired of it. And they said, You know what? Who can, who's going to give us flesh to eat now watch this verse 5 we remember the fish that we did eat in Egypt freely the cucumbers the melons the leeks the onions the garlic you know do you see what they're saying they're saying you know God at least in Egypt we had a choice at least in Egypt we had a variety yeah I mean remember the fact that taskmasters are standing over you beating you to death every every day too but let's don't talk about that at least we have some good food while we're in Egypt and look at verse 6 but now our soul is dried away watch this there is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes mm, my goodness alive when Israel was in the wilderness God provided for their material needs which included manna from heaven. I, I, I want you to understand something and remember something. God knew they needed something to eat. And so what did God do? The Bible says that uh, early in the morning, before daylight, when the dew had fell on the ground, that this manna would fall with it. And, and the word manna literally means, what is it? That's what the word manna means. What is it? I mean, they'd go out there and they saw this little round, court, like the Bible uh, describes it like a coriander seed uh, but it was it, it was kind of round kind if you can t maybe kind of picture popcorn you know after it's popped just a little white ball type deal and, and the Bible says that they had to gather a certain portion every day if they gathered too much it would spoil on them 
God did that for a purpose. And so uh, they gathered just enough for their family. They were able to go back and bake it and cook it. And the Bible says it tastes like honey. It had a sweetness to it, like fresh oil and honey. You, you see, God not only gave a manna, y'all, but, but he gave a little flavor to it. Amen? Aren't you happy for salt and pepper? Amen. I don't look forward to the day where the doc says no more, you know. But until then, we'll keep going on, amen. But, but I mean, not only did it, you say, well, that's just no bland thing. No, it wasn't bland. God put some flavor to it. God knew exactly what they needed. And it was enough every single day for their family, regardless of how big their family was. It was enough. But yet they got to the point and they said, that's it. All we have before us. Now listen to what they're calling it. The Bible says that God sent bread from heaven down. And they said, all we have before us is this manna. Do you see the despisement there in their eyes? You see they're lusting after evil things. That's what the Bible calls it. They were dissatisfied with it. I mean, basically what they're saying is we're tired of this old manna. We want some flesh to eat. Who's going to give us some flesh to eat? Well, friend, let me, ask, let me tell you something. There's a caution right here. Be careful what you ask God for. Oh, he gave them flesh to eat. Matter of fact, he gave them so much flesh, the Bible says it come out of their nostrils. And, and, and Moses was saying, God said, you stand back, Moses, I'm going to give them some flesh. He says, and, and it's not just going to be a week, it's not going to be for two weeks, it's going to be for a whole month they're going to eat flesh. He said, they're going to eat flesh to the point that they're going to puke it up. And Moses is like, what are we going to do, have to slay all of our cattle? I mean, how in the world are you going to do this? And God looks at him and says, Moses, do you think my hand is short? Do you think, just watch, God sent the quail in, didn't he, into the camp. And every day, boy, they ate quail. And you know what? They ate it till they got sick of it. You know, every now and then we think, you know, I, I want something else. Hey, do you know what I'm talking about? We eat stuff. Now, I've been on Nutrisystem for the last month. And I'm going to tell you right now, there are times I just want something else. That there are times that stuff just don't satisfy y'all. Uh, good stuff. Small portion. Good stuff. But every now and then, a cheese stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, and this week I got off my Nutrisystem, first time in a month. Went to Spokane, ate whatever I wanted, did whatever I wanted. And y'all, I come back and I lost five pounds. Now I walk five miles a day every morning. That helped. We won't talk about Jill and Dawson, but I lost five pounds. But anyway, uh, <laughs> digging a hole, amen, digging a hole. But, but they got to the point, and they said, you know, we're just sick of this. Same old, same old every day. Now, I want you to understand the bigger picture here. There's a much bigger picture. God gave them bread from heaven. And y'all listen to me. Anytime God gives, he gives his best. Do you hear me? And they got to the point where they said, we're not satisfied with this any longer. And you look back and you say, well, why do we need to learn a history lesson from that? What's the big deal with that? Let me turn this around for you real quick. I don't want you to say nothing. I just want you to think about what I'm about to say. How many times in your life, be honest, God knows your heart. How many times in your life have you ever been dissatisfied with what God provides? Can we relate? Yeah. And if you say no, then that's a lie. Because we can all relate to what he's talking about. There, don't get me wrong, God's good to us, y'all. God provides every single need. Jesus says, you don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to put on, uh, what you're going to drink. The Lord's going to supply all your needs. Maybe not all of your wants and wishes, but He's going to supply every need that you have in life. I take, him, I take it word for word for what He says. He's going to supply my need. But I'm human. There are times where that need that He supplies May not, it, it, there's a war going on with what I need and what I want. You know what I mean? And so they got out here in this wilderness and they said, oh my goodness alive, we're tired of all of this stuff right here. We're not satisfied with what God has given us. And so when the Bible says they lusted evil things, it simply means they were not satisfied with God's provision for their life. And let me tell you something. If you get to the point where you ever verbalize that, God, I'm just not satisfied with what you give me. You better watch out. Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Either way. And that's, that's not a scare tactic. That's just, a, listen, 
If we complain against God's provision, that's a very serious thing. A lot of believers today have the same problem. And the problem is they're not satisfied with what God's provided. Let me give you an example. Uh, God's given them a job, but they want a better job. Right? God's given them food, but they want better food. God's given them clothing, but they want better clothing. God's given them a house, but they want a better house. God's given them a car, but they want a better car. God has given them everything they need to live, but they're not satisfied with what God has given. They want more. Does it ring a bell? Is there an application here? Yeah, for all of us. That's why the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8, that we're to be content with such things as we have. Right? Y'all, I'm not saying don't ever try to, uh, I'm not saying don't try to work and get an education to get a better job. And to go, I'm not saying, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is when God provides, we ought to be thankful. The Bible says we're to rejoice in the Lord. The Bible says, give in everything, give thanks unto the Lord, regardless of where he's got you. And remember, he's got you. That's the main point. He's got you. And, and, and so wherever I, my lot in life, I need to rejoice in the Lord and to be thankful. The Bible says we're to be content. That word content means enough. It means sufficient. And God always gives us what. In other words, if God has given us what we need, and he has, then we could, should consider that to be enough. Right? The writer of Hebrews put it like this, Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. We live in a very discontented world. People are not content. I'm not just talking about lost people. I'm talking about God's people. But we're discontent. We want more. Well, there's just a lust after evil things and, and we're never satisfied and we're always propelled for more. Do y'all real? I want more of these earthly goods. I want more. Y'all, this stuff's going to burn up anyway. My goodness, that's what he's talking about. They lusted after evil things. They were not satisfied for God's provisions for their life. So, it says God was not well pleased. Why? They lusted after evil things. Our application? Be content. That's what the Bible teaches. Hey, wherever, where God guides, God provides. You remember that. Wherever God guides, God provides. And so wherever he's guiding you along the way, he's going to provide it in your every need in life. Be content with that and thank God for that. Secondly, not only uh, did they lust after evil things, notice verse 7, he talks about how they worshiped idols. Now, now look at verse 7. Neither be ye what? Idolaters. What is an idolater? Someone who worships an idol, right? As were some of them. You say, you mean to tell me God led them out of Egypt, out of bondage, put Moses in charge of them, leading them through the promised land, and here they are wanting to bow down to an idol? That's exactly what I'm telling you. You say, well, the nerve of these people. How could they turn their back on the God that dried the Red Sea where they could cross, gave them a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, provided everything in their life? How in the world could they want to worship something else? Hey, good question. How could their allegiance be to anyone else? Good question. You see how it relates to where we are today? You say, well, Brother Brian, when did Israel worship idols? Well, actually, they worship idols on many occasions. But the occasion that's referenced in our text here, if you remember, is when Moses went up to the mountain to receive the law. You remember the story? And he was gone 40 days. And the Bible says that they were all down there, and they started wondering where Moses is at, and then they figured out, well, Moses ain't coming back. You know, I mean, I don't know who this Moses guy is, but he ain't, he ain't been, he ain't, he's not coming back. And if you remember what happened, the Bible says that they asked, they said, let us make us an idol. Now, let us make us a God, a little g. Let us make us a God that will lead us back to Egypt. Boy, there's a lot wrong with that statement. You know what I mean? <laughs> Number one, <laughs> don't you realize what God just saved you out of and from? And you want to go back? Um... Uh, Let's, but why did they think they needed a God? Something, Y'all, here's always been the big issue in, in religion. 
man, mankind, now listen to me carefully. No matter where you go in the world, you're going to find people who worship something. You can go on the backside of Africa. You can go to jungles where there's hardly been any presence. And I'm telling you right now, you can go back there where they got bones through their noses and all that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you what, they bow down to something. Man's just that religious. Man's going to worship something. Unfortunately, sometimes he worships himself. Sometimes he worships his job. Could be their family or whatever else. Or bow down to a totem pole. Whatever it may be. But mankind is going to worship something. But if you remember, they got up there and, and, and then Moses is not coming down and the people are getting antsy down there, you know, uh, uh, there uh, uh, under the mountain. And they, they start taking off all their gold and stuff, you know. He was gathering gold. And, they, and, and when Moses finally come back and he talked to Aaron saying, what's going on? And Aaron, he did what everybody else here today would do. He put the blame back on the people. Well, the people. Moses, the people. Uh, and by the way, Moses, I don't know how this thing got erected. We just throwed all this gold in the fire and out popped this cat. Really? <laughs> uh, and I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people. Moses was angry. He was angry to the point... They ground that stuff y'all up into powder and made them eat it. Mm. You, th you think they were sick of quail? Wait till they ate that. But, but you say, what, what's the big deal here, Brother Brian? Um, you say, well, I'm sure glad we don't worship idols today. Okay. Idol worship. Sometimes, that's not a problem with Christians today, is it? Yeah. Big deal, y'all. More prevalent than what we realize. Anything, listen to me, anything that becomes more important to us than our relationship with God and our service to Him is an idol. Anything you put between you and God is an idol. I worship my kids. You better be careful by making a statement like that. The Bible says God is a jealous God. He ain't going to share that with nobody. I understand what you mean when you say they're my life, they're all of my heart. Uh, just be careful, okay? God is to be number one. That's why Jesus said, Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God is to be preeminent in our life. He's to be first place uh, in our life. And, and, and so be careful when you say, This is my life. This is my heart. This is, I just worship. And a lot of people, will, and, and, and unknowingly, many times, they'll put things between and God, friend, if you bow to anything, and I'm not just talking about literally on your face, but I'm talking about when you pledge allegiance to anything that comes between you and God and your service to God, that's an idol. That's an idol. It could be your job. It could be your family. It, it can be our amusement, our hobbies, and all of that. It could even be our own selves that we're worshiping. You know, some people love themselves that much they worship themselves. Did you know that? Anything at all that we put before God becomes an idol. And the Bible says, neither be ye idolaters as some of them were. Right? That's why Jesus told us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's why John tells us in 1 John 5, 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Just a simple command, little children, keep yourself from idols. I'm telling you, friend, if you're saved, he bought you. He paid the price for your salvation. You belong to Him. And that's why Paul tells us in this book of 1 Corinthians, you're bought with a price. You're not your own. Right? You belong to Him. He's your God. So they, they, they became idolaters. They also committed fornication. Look at verse 8. He says, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. 23,000 people, Israelites, lost their lives in one day because of fornication. God hates it. Now, there were several times God's people committed fornication, but what he's talking about is the story of Numbers 25. Numbers 25, you'll look at the first five verses there, uh, you'll see where they, listen, not only did they, they commit physical fornication, they also committed spiritual fornication. And that's what you see here in Numbers chapter 25. Uh, they bowed down to the God of the Moabites. And God slew 23,000 of them right there on the spot. Wow. Y'all, God is a jealous God. 
That's serious business with God. We ought to learn what happened to Israel. We're to avoid sexual sins at all costs. That's fornication, both physically and spiritually. Spiritual fornication. You say, how can we avoid this? Well, it's very simple. If you're single, simply abstain from any and all sexual activity until after you're married. Now, y'all, I'm going to tell you something. You can laugh at that if you want to. But you'll never improve on God's plan for marriage. You hear me? You know what God says when he says, do not commit adultery, thou shalt not commit adultery? Do you know why those commandments are there? They're not there to ruin your life. They're there to protect you. What God is saying when he says, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, what he's saying is, don't hurt yourself. He loves you so much, he don't want to see you hurt. Don't do it. Save yourself a whole lot of trouble if you just do what God says do. Isn't that something? I used to tell my oldest son that. Apparently, you like to get whooped. You could save yourself a whole lot of trouble if you just listen. Anybody ever had any kids like that? Say amen. Amen. All right. Hey, we got to love them through it. Beat them through it too, but love them through it. But, hey, if you're married, guess what? Stay faithful to your spouse. You see how it works? He says save yourself a lot of trouble. In our society today, sexually transmitted diseases are a real problem. Some are even very fatal. But did you realize that if everyone followed God's plan, did things God's way, there would be absolutely no sexually transmitted disease in this world? God knows best. God's way is best. When he says don't do it, don't do it. He's looking out for your benefit. Then, then fourthly, they, they tempted the Lord. Look at verse 9. He says, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. You say, well, when did Israel tempt Christ? Well, they tempted the Lord a lot. And, and by the way, they actually tempted the Lord many times, but this occasion that he's referencing here is Numbers 21. You know, there's a lot of big stuff happening in the book of Numbers. Okay, it's, a, it's an interesting book. Do you remember when they went against God's command? Uh, uh, the Bible says that they, they, they tempt. You say, what does it mean to, to, to uh, tempt Christ? It simply means they tested his patience. They tested his patience. Any parent ever have a child test your patience? Hmm? And, and you know what? There's sometimes patience comes to an end. Right? Can I tell you something about the long-suffering of God? I'm so thankful, Brother Gary, that God is a long-suffering God. I'm telling y'all, I'm talking about with me personally. I'm so thankful that he is a patient, loving God, but y'all, there is an end to the patience. The long-suffering of God only goes so long, right? What does it mean they tempted Christ? They tested his patience. And Israel discovered the hard way that there's a limit to God's patience. That's when God sent those poisonous serpents among them. You remember that? He was biting the people. People were dying. And then he told them to fashion a serpent on a pole, a brass serpent on the pole, lift that serpent high. And when they looked upon that serpent in faith, they would be healed. Beautiful picture Jesus said in his ministry, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Beautiful picture looking up in faith. We need to learn a lesson to what happened here to Israel. Y'all, there is a limit to the long suffering of God. If we tempt him, if we deliberately test his patience, that's one thing you don't want to do with God is deliberately just test his patience. If you just keep pushing and pushing and pushing, you know what you need to do. You know you need to get your right life right with God. You, you've been convicted of it. The Word of God describes it. And you just don't. You just don't. You just put it off. And, and you're pushing the patience of God in your life. Remember, there comes a point when God's patient. It's, it's done. It's enough. You're in great danger of experiencing His chastening. I'm reminded by what the writer of Hebrews says, Hebrews 10, 31. It says, the Lord shall judge his people. And then it says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Y'all, that, that's big stuff. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Well, they tempted Christ. They pushed him. They tested his patience. There was many times God answered and they didn't like it. You know? Well, last thing they did here that he mentions 
is that they murmured against God. Look at verse 10. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. You say, well, when did Israel murmur? Well, a lot. Okay? Well, the better question is when they didn't. When didn't they murmur? Right? But I mean, it was a constant murmur. It was a constant complaint. Oh, Moses, you brought us out in this desert to die. At least we had some cucumbers back here in Egypt. You know what I mean? Are you kidding me? They beat you like a Hebrew slave, which you were. And, but all you can think about is the cucumbers and the melons and the onions. You know, in our text, reference here is when they complained to Moses and Aaron about how the Lord handled the rebellion of Korah. And if you go back and study that, it's very interesting. Uh, the Bible says, you know, here were some other guys that, you know, God dealt very severe. Uh, he opened up the ground, just swallowed them up. Thousands of them died because they tried to rebel against Moses and his authority and God wasn't going to see to it. He, the ground swallowed them up. Well, there were some people that didn't like the way God did things. <laughs> oh, friend, don't ever put yourself in a position like you want to have a one-on-one -on -one with God. Just try to straighten him out. That ain't going to work. That ain't going to work. The people murmured about this and God sent a plague to among the congregation 14,700 of them died. Wow. And many more would have died had not Moses and Aaron intervened for them. That's what the Bible says. We need to learn not to murmur to God. To murmur basically means to complain. That's what murmuring. Uh, the word murmur, it's interesting. It comes from the root word murmur. comes from a cooing of doves. Have you ever heard a dove coo? You ever heard that sound, that low? It's not loud. Kind of under the, under, the you know, under the tone, but it's there. That's what murmuring is. What mur <laughs> we murmur a lot. Hey, the pulpit to the pew. We murmur a lot. Now, we may not say it out loud. We may not bring it up in the business meeting. But we'll, I can't believe. I can't, can you believe what they say? I mean, it's just, y'all, that's murmur. And that's, that, that's complaining. Now, there's nothing wrong. Listen to me. There's nothing wrong. Maybe there's something you don't like. Then say something. Let's get it worked out. You know what I mean? But murmuring, belly aching, the old word for it, belly aching. Have you ever worked with a whiner? Have you ever worked with someone who was always negative, always complaining? Boy, ain't they a joy to be around? No. Hey, Moses had to lead two million of them, y'all. You're talking about a man who was at his wit's end. One time he asked God to kill him. He said, I didn't give birth to these people. These ain't my babies. These are your babies. You know? And, and I'm telling you, there's times that you feel like that. There's been times I've gone, I've gone back to the office. Not here. But I've gone back to the office and said, God, they're your people, not mine. I didn't give birth to them. <laughs> oh, I don't think a preacher would do that. <laughs> Just depends on how the business meeting goes, y'all. But what I'm saying is, what I'm saying, that, that, I'm just kidding. But what I'm saying is that they complain, they mur murmuring basically is saying, God, I don't like this. Uh, I'm not satisfied with this. And the best thing I can do is just complain about it, right? Well, uh, the, God was very strict with them when they murmured against him. Uh, Y'all listen, we, we don't need to complain about God's provision for our life. That's the main focus of what he's talking about here. God's provision for your life. You, you, you don't need to be murmuring uh, for things like that. We shouldn't complain about other things as well. Do you realize instead of, being, instead of complaining, we ought to be thankful? Well, I don't like the circumstances. Can I tell you something? They could be a whole lot worse. Do you realize there are people in this world today who would love to trade places with you? You think you got issues? You think you got problems? I got so embarrassed, I was moderating a portion of our ABA national meeting that the vice presidents do. They moderate certain portions. And I told them, you know, if you're in favor of this motion, let it be known by you know, lifting your right hand. And I said that like five or six times. Boom, your right hand. After the meeting was over for that day, and this was all in fun, by the way, but I got the point. This guy walks up behind me, he touches me on the shoulder, and I turn around and look, and I, I knew he was a, one of our preachers from another state. Uh, and I'm not going to call names because we're on air here. But uh, anyway, but he said, hey, he said, you know what? 
he said, I just basically had to, uh, I had to be against everything we voted on today. And I said, why? Well, y'all, he don't have a right arm. You talking about making a little preacher feel about that tall? But God taught me something. You just say, raise your hand. Amen? That not specifically which one. We don't, I don't even know why I said that. What, what, what is that? Y'all got me running rabbits all over the place. Hey, y'all, it's good to be back home. It's good to be back home. But we should be thankful. And he told me that. That's what I was saying. And we laughed. We hugged each other. Uh, I said, brother, I am so sorry. I, I said, it, he said, hey, I've, I've used this as a funny all my ministry. He said, I was trying to, to vote, but, you know, that's all I could, all I could do. And, <laughs> I, that's all I could think about when I got up to moderate again with this guy doing this. So, the Bible says, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God. This is the will of God. Not just for the good, y'all, but for the bad. Uh, a complaining person is never thankful. And a thankful person is never complaining. That's what God wants you to do. Well, I don't like my circumstances. Well, they could be a lot worse. Just thank God and go on. Now, we've seen that Israel not only gives us some positive examples to follow, they also give us some negative things. And that's what Paul's just wanting them to see both sides of this thing, you know? Perhaps today you need to take a lesson from Israel. Now, I want you to think about just what we've talked about, and let's just wrap this up. You say, well, what do I need to do, Brother Brian? Well, maybe, maybe you need to learn to be content in your life. Maybe you just need to say, you know what, Lord? You must be real displeased with me. All I'm wanting is more, more, more. Just help me be content. Help me be thankful for what you've given me. It's amazing. It's amazing what will happen. Maybe you need to begin putting God first in your life. Maybe today in your life, God's not where he needs to be. Y'all, that's called idolatry. When he's not in his right place, he's out of place. So it's idolatry. Maybe, maybe you need to commit yourself to live a life of sexual purity. Not to commit fornication against the Lord. Maybe you need to stop trying, testing God's patience in your life. Maybe there's something you know in your heart you need to do, but yet God, God, God's convicted you, you need to do this. Put his finger on the pulse of your heart and said, you need to do this. And you're still rebelling against that. Maybe we need to stop complaining and just start being thankful. What do you need to do today? That's the reason why these stories are here, y'all. Every one of them. That's why they're here. What is it today that you need to do? Maybe, maybe today in this service you need to be saved, right? Maybe you need to understand that the only way to heaven is through Jesus. And it's all about Jesus. And he's the way, the only way, the living way. And he's provided a way for you. And I'm glad that that way is narrow, aren't you? I'm glad there's only one way to heaven. I'm glad there's not a hundred different ways to heaven. I'm glad there's only one, and Jesus is the only way. That's what he said. So maybe you need to be saved. Hey, good news, you can be saved today. Maybe you need to, I don't know, maybe there's something in your life maybe you just need to come pray about. Maybe you just need to start putting God first. Whatever it may be, just here's the deal. Do it today. Don't wait. Don't procrastinate. So many people say, well, when I get things straightened out, I'll do this. And can I ask you a question? How's that working for you? You can't straighten it out. You need God's help now and today. Do what he's leading you to do today as we stand together and pray. Father in heaven, thank you today for your word. Thank you for making your word apply to us in every situation in our life. Lord, I'm grateful to be the pastor of this church, and I thank you for having me and my family here. And Lord, we all just want to grow together in grace and in knowledge. I pray you help us along the way. Maybe there's something someone needs to do today. And Father, we'll give you glory, whatever it is. Save a soul, change a life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.